Hey you guys, it's Karen and I thought I would come and do a video about my qualifications and background and what I did in the NHS when I was working in hospitals and yeah, I thought that might be interesting to some of you. I have done this video before, I can't remember which channel I did it on. I don't think it was on this channel, um, but I know that obviously I've got a lot of new subscribers who may be wondering where I get my knowledge from. Um, so I have been interested in all things medical since I was a teenager. Um, I got a job at 14 years old, a Saturday job in a chemist, and that was it. It just fascinated me. And I was so lucky because I was working for the pharmacist was called Mr. Grant, and he was just adorable. He was so protective over all the girls that worked for him, but he was also very... It's funny because he, we weren't allowed to wear trousers to work. We were only allowed to wear a skirt. But he was very empowering in that I was a 14-year-old girl, but he wanted to teach me how to do some things behind the counter, like with the drugs, and he'd tell me things. And, you know, if in case I wanted to go into a career as a pharmacist. And so he was really empowering in one way, but like I said, in another way, he wouldn't know we weren't allowed to wear trousers. There was no men that worked there, actually. Um... But that's where my kind of love of drugs and, you know, I already loved beauty stuff. So there was a lot of beauty stuff. And it was like, here is this shop that's a combination of beauty and drugs and health things. It was just like heaven to me. I loved working there. Couldn't believe I got paid. Although most of my pay would go on stuff that I'd found during my shift that I'd put under the counter to pay for where later on. You know, I'd get my money and then give it back again. So that's where my interest came from. I, um, I had wanted to go to college. I couldn't for a lot of monetary reasons and, and other reasons, things that were going on. Um, and so I just kind of went off into my different careers that I've had over the years um, in hotels. And um, I did a, a lot of lot of work in hotels and hotel management and whatnot. I did a lot of training over the years here and there, you know, little courses. I would go to little evening classes at colleges and whatnot. And I did a really good um, diploma in herbal medicine. And that I just loved, absolutely loved. And I still, to this day, love herbal medicine. I love everything about herbs and all different supplements and what I've got a full cupboard of supplements. I've got every book on supplements, you know, it's a world that fascinates me. Um, but I ended up in a job after hotels. I ended up taking a job in computer training. Um, I was operations manager there and I really didn't like the job. You know, it was my first sort of day job, if you like, because a lot of the time in hotels, I was working nights and I was certainly working shifts and whatnot. And I wanted to be in the medical industry. And I'm, I'm somebody that throughout my life, if I've wanted something, I've really just decided I'm going to get it. And I was like, you know what? I want to go and work in the NHS. I want to work in a hospital. Like that just was my dream. And it's like when I was young, I wanted to work in a library. And so I kept writing to the library until I got a job there and I worked there for a year and a half. Um, so I started retraining while I was working for this computer training company. I started a HNC in health sciences. Um, and I thought, well, I'll do that for you know a couple of years and I'll keep an eye out on the jobs in the NHS and see if there's any that I can get. So I I did get a job in the end. I got it in 2006. And the, the woman that employed me did tell me it was a lot to do with my experience of like managing people, but also a lot of the fact that I had been retraining in this HND, HNC in health sciences. Um, so it showed my kind of passion for the medical industry. Um, so that was 2006. And that job was research radiology radiology research coordinator so it was working for radiology the the radiology department in a few different hospitals um across the lothians um and i just was in heaven i mean i i had two had one main office which was in a little kind of corridor um by the audiology department randomly it was above the radiology department i had this little office but in my office there was x-ray machines you know just the blocks on the wall with with some x-rays because it was used as a teaching room on a Wednesday and so on a Wednesday I would have to vacate my office and go to the other hospital where I shared a room with a medic that worked he used to work at children's hospital and he was now a radiologist and he would just tell me fascinating stories you know and but just walking through the corridors of a hospital a lot of people don't like hospitals but to me I was like this is is my dream like this is amazing you know so anyway, I worked um, in radiology and the job that I had was, firstly, I needed to set up a database. So I created a, a database from Access. 
So I built this access database. Um, and the idea was when you do research, you need to get approval from the research and development department for NHS Lothian. And NHS Lothian, in order to give that approval to you, they need to have approval from any departments involved. So the cancer department or the radiology department, because they would be doing scans on some of these studies. And the radiology department was basically so slow that it was slowing down the whole research process. And there was a lot of guidelines from the government as to how quick you should be turning over research studies. And so my job was to speed the whole thing up to get this database in place so that the radiologists could go and check and look at the research but also for me to be the go-between and say to them you know what's the hold up on this signature why are you not signing this study off and I have to say at first it was extremely difficult because I just couldn't get hold of these people like I would try and phone them I would go to their office and obviously they were somewhere else or I, I could just never get hold of them. They would not respond to me. You know, they wouldn't respond to emails. I would phone them. They wouldn't answer. Um, but eventually I did get hold of them all and you know, managed to work through the problems. And I just found it so interesting. Um, and some of the, the reasons that they were not signing off on projects were really interesting too. And things had come to a halt. So, for example, there was a cancer study that was ready to be approved, but the only thing missing from this whole study was the sign off from radiology. And so it had gone to this particular radiologist and I got a hold of him. He was a very funny man. I really liked him actually. And I said to him like, what's the problem? Why are you not signing this off? Um, and, and this was where the issue lay. It, not just that they weren't signing it off. You just wouldn't, there'd just be like silence, radio silence. They wouldn't email the oncologist back and say, look, this is my issue. Can we chat and meet about it? meet and chat about it they would just you just wouldn't hear anything from them so I was there to kind of chase them and go what's going on here so I said to him what's the problem with this study is there a problem or have you just not had a chance to read it or you know what because they need to read like you know it's this this thick the files which I, I would sit and read at bedtime um, and he said no he said I don't agree with this study he said because it is for it was a study for breast cancer and I don't know with what, I can't remember what the drugs were. I think it was just a combo of different chemos. But as part of the research protocol of the procedure was to have all of these CT scans. And it was on age, women aged 30 to 40 or 20 to 40, something like that. And what this radiologist said to me was, There's, they're going to get too much radiation. Um, and I was like, okay, so I have something. I can go back to the oncologist and say, this is the issue that radiology has. So I went back to this oncologist and said, you know, they're going to get too much radiation. What he was worried about was their fertility. But when I went back to the guy, he was to the oncologist, he was saying it's more important to cure them of cancer than to worry about their fertility. So I went back to the radiology. So it kind of went on like that. What I eventually managed to do and get them both to agree to was to put it into the patient information sheet that the radiation as part of this study, because he wouldn't, the oncologist would not agree to reduce the, the CT scans that he needed to see the results of the study. Um, I got him to agree to make sure it was extremely clear in the patient information sheet that if you are part of this study, you'll be exposed to more radiation and this may affect fertility. So that the women who fertility was very important to them could take that into account. So that was my job there and I loved it. Um, I was only there for two years because in two years um at the two year point i was i had gone over to have a meeting in the research and development department i was very nervous about this meeting because it was with the director of r d and she was um a very well-renowned she's actually a lady um virologist and she she was quite stern actually she was just a little or well, she is just a little old lady she's retired now but she was very very stern but very well respected and she had discussed, she was discussing some of the, the radiology database and asking me how I'd done it and could, could I do something like that for research and development. And she then told me about a job that was coming up that she wanted me to apply for. Um, and I was just like, oh God, I don't know. You know, I was thinking, I felt kind of like in, in radiology, I had my own little office. Nobody, I was my own boss almost, you know, I, I rarely saw my boss and I just kind of did my own thing. I went between hospitals, meeting the radiologist. This job that was going to be in the R&D department was in a, 
It was still in the hospital. It's attached to the hospital, but it was in a separate building. But it was just amongst everybody. It was an office job. You know, it was a proper, like, I don't know. There was a lot more people there. And not only that, when I had a look at the job, you needed to do a presentation for it. And I was just so scared because I thought, I still didn't feel like I knew enough about the NHS and I hate presentations. Detest them. Anyway, I decided that, you know, being as she had asked, there was obviously a chance that I could get it. It was two bands higher than I was on. I was on a band five when I started and it was going up two bands, um, which was re very, very unusual. Um, and actually I, ha I had to get special permission to get put up on, to go two bands up because you're only supposed to go up one band in the NHS. Um, so I went for the job and I got told that I got the job and I, it was amazing because there was three people I had to do this presentation to. I was so nervous. I can't tell you about this presentation for a week before I was taking every, I was taking Rhodiola rosacea. I was taking rescue remedy. I was taking everything I could think of to try and stop myself being sick and, you know, just can't, I was so close to just cancel it and going, I can't do it. I can't do it. But I did it in front of these three people. And apparently it was unanimous to, to employ me for this job. So this job was research governance coordinator. Um, and so it was, I had one member of staff working for me and it was basically reviewing all of the research that came in. And so now I wasn't just looking at radiology studies, studies that involved radiology. I was looking at every study, you know, so diabetic studies and dermatology studies and just every kind of study you can imagine, neurology studies, every kind of study. I had to go through and research them, uh, read them and create a kind of a governance checklist that made sense um, and, a, and a procedure that was better than the one that was in place to get them again approved quickly. And there's a whole different, um, there's a lot of things you need to do to get a research study approved. There's a step before it where it needs to be what's called sponsored by the board, which I, I ended up doing later on. But I would research, review these studies, hand them out to people to review. They saw, some of them went to the pharmacist, some of them went to um, nurses. There was different people of us that reviewed these studies, but I would put the procedures in place that they had to tick this, you know, everything on this list to make sure that it was it abided by all the research governance. And it was things like um, if they were taking blood from a patient, was there a specific line on the consent form? Because if there wasn't, it was illegal because it's considered battery in Scotland to take blood um, for DNA, sorry, I didn't say that part. If you take blood and you're looking at DNA, it's a, a prison offence, you know, so it, it was things like that. What you then did, everybody that had been allocated a study, there was a meeting every week um, and it would be, you know, a long meeting. There was about 12 people in this meeting and it was made up of pharmacists and um, there was a guy from the ethics board there. There was a director there um, who, like I said, she was a virologist or later on it was a cardiologist um, they always had to have a pharmacist, I think, there. And then each person that had reviewed their study would present it to the room and say if we thought it should be approved or not. Um, and so the very first meeting I went to, obviously, I hadn't been, I hadn't, hadn't done much training. I hadn't been, I wasn't confident, let's just say that. But I had this study that was a cancer study and it was a study... I think it was a study of throat cancer. Is that right? It's a study of throat cancer. And what they were, what they wanted to do was put 50% put of people to have the, the cancer removed. Maybe it was some kind of neck cancer. 50% of people to have the, the cancer removed and the other 50% to have the cancer removed and also remove the lymph nodes. And then they wanted to follow these people up and see if there was any difference, if there was any need to take these lymph nodes out was the point of the study. Um, did the people stay cancer free on the 50-50? So I read it through and I thought it all seems really, really good. The only question I had was, I, I suppose it's just from, you have to think of it from your own, if you were the patient. And I thought if I was the patient, I would ask the question, if I didn't go on this research study, what would you do? Would you take my lymph nodes out? Normally, what is standard practice? It didn't mention this in the patient information sheet. Um, in fact, it didn't mention it really through the study, but I was saying, you know, it doesn't mention to the patient whether or not this is standard practice because me personally, I would say that if it's standard practice to take them out, like I'd want to choose that. I'd want to know what the standard practice was. 
And if the standard practice was to not take them out, I would choose to go on the study so there's a chance of getting them out. Because I'd want to take as much as you can out. You know, that's the, the way I would go. So I mentioned this in this meeting and I was so scared because, like I said, there's 12 people. I didn't like talking in front of people. I was new. And she'd been kind of having a go at people. And she'd actually slammed her papers down at one point and said something to somebody. Um, and so here was me asking this question. She was chairing the meeting. And I thought, oh, God, what's she going to say? But she actually was really, really complimentary. And she said, it, it actually made me feel terrible because she went, see, somebody asking an intelligent question. This is, you know, and it, it was like, oh, my goodness. Um, but I was really chuffed with myself. And I thought, yeah, I've got this. I know what this job is. You know, I, I can do this. I can absolutely do this. Um, and so I did. That's what I did. I reviewed projects. I went to present them. I got much better at presenting them. I had to present everything from, like I had one study to present on erectile dysfunction in men over 65 with diabetes, um, which used to freak me out because that's what my dad was. <laughs> and uh, as in over 65 with diabetes. Um, I had to present one on vaginal fluid, you know, and you have to say this to your colleagues and explain what the study is. I had to do another one on heavy periods that I had to detail how they, how the whole thing worked. And, you know, it could be really embarrassing, but it obviously just increased my confidence, you know, and really helped me with my confidence. What happened then was, I could do a whole nother video on, but there was my boss in this department, the manager was an absolute nutter. And ended up, she ended up getting sacked, but we had to go through the court. I had to go through the courts as a witness to, to some of the things she'd done. She, she locked me in a room. Well, I mean, she was like crazy. <laughs> and um, she left and I was promoted to research governance manager. And so I was then doing the step before the governance review began was the one for the whole of the, the board in that we looked at the study and said, are we even going to look at this? Are we going to consider this research? Or is this something else you need to do? to get it ready and that was more looking at like does it have funding is it a good research question um does it align with the nhs rules like there was one on um using probiotic milk for babies and it was like okay that doesn't really align with the breastfeeding policy we're trying to put in place at the moment things like that and i just i loved it i absolutely loved it um but for the last kind of year of of doing that job i was really feeling the effects of the ehlers loss on my joints. I was also um, getting these, well, I didn't know they were migraines at the time, but I was just feeling awful every single day. Um, and so I asked if I could work from home, which was granted. Um, when I started working from home, I was working from home three or four days a week and then going into the office one or two days a week to have meetings with my staff. I then had like five or six staff at that point. Um, and I had to go into these weekly meetings to present the studies, of course. Um, I got Watson, got my, my little dog, my, he was a puppy obviously at the time. And yeah, it was fine apart from these, having these health issues and even being at home didn't seem to be doing anything. I was just every single day I was getting these migraines. Um, and then came a restructure and it was, funding was cut. The CSO, the government, um, cut funding to research. And so we had to have a whole restructure of our office. Um, excuse me, I know I'm itching a lot. I don't know why I'm so itchy. Um, we had a different boss in the office then. There was a different director. It was no longer the virologist. It was now a cardiologist. Um, and we didn't see him very much, actually. And we did have another... So there was somebody else above me in between myself and him who was the head of research governance. She was lovely, actually. She was really nice. Um, and so this restructure... It involved me being offered voluntary redundancy, which I eventually took because discussing it with my seniors, basically the alternative was I, I would take, I would have to be medically retired because there was another job that I could have taken that was the same level. But firstly, when you looked at the job description, because of the cut of funding, the job involved everything I was doing and then bits and pieces from other jobs that I just was looking at it going, that's not possible. Like I barely had time to do what I was doing already. Um, but not only that, it was a job that was not a work from home position. It had to be in the office. And that would have been really, really difficult for me with my health. You know, with the, the lights were a problem and getting to the toilets in that place because it was a research facility. I had a, a pass. I had to go through so many doors to get to the toilets. There was just so many things about it that it would have been really difficult for me at that time to work in an office and to take on more work than I was already doing. 
um, and possibly be medically retired if, you know, my illness didn't resolve itself, which, you know, here we are five years later and I still have it. Um, so I took voluntary redundancy. It was a good, it was a good time for me to do that and, you know, take, take time off to explore what I wanted to do. I retrained in, in dogs and <laughs> dog grooming. I trained in dog grooming and, um, dog photography. I was doing the dog photography before I left the NHS. I did about 30 photo shoots in the NHS. I offered them free. Um, and then, um, went on to do more more photo, more photo shoots after that. Something I didn't mention actually, um, I completely forgot to mention this, was when when I was in radiology, I kind of forgot about my HNC and further training. I didn't forget about it, but I couldn't really afford it um, because I had taken a big pay drop in that, in that job from what I was on as manager at the operations computer training center. Um, and so I couldn't really afford to do any more training. Um, but when I moved into research and development, the director then paid for me. Well, we went 50-50. She agreed a deal of 50-50 on time and money. So I, w I carried on with the Open University course and did my HND in health sciences. And she covered 50% and I covered 50%, which was still pretty expensive. And then I was given uh, one Monday a month for study. And then what I also did between that is I worked what's called condensed hours. So I started at seven o'clock in the morning, finished at five o'clock at night, and I would also take another Monday. So I had two Mondays off in every month for study. Um, and so that was really, really useful. But funding was cut for that, actually, when I don't know whether it was when the directors changed and she wouldn't agree to it. I can't actually remember now, but I wasn't able to continue on with my, what was a degree. It was working towards a degree in health sciences, um, but I got as far as the HND. Um, so that's kind of me, you know, the last five years have been, I had my own grooming salon here, which was really successful. I was full within a couple of weeks, um, but I couldn't continue on because of my health. I couldn't continue on with the photography. I had a lot of interest in that. Um, I tried a few little thing, other things along the way. Um, and if I get my health back, you know, 100%, I'm not 100% sure what I'll do, to be honest. I might well go back to the NHS. I would really like to go back to the NHS part time. I don't know what they've done through lockdown. I'd be really interested to find out how many people are working from home because it just wasn't something they were keen on. You know, it wasn't an NHS way really um, but the world has changed that'd so be interesting to see what they were like and that would certainly address a lot of the parking issues because there's a lot of issues to staff with parking at working at hospitals for me because of my Elis Danlos which was considered a disability I was allowed to get a parking spot at both hospitals one of them I had to pay at I paid monthly 20 pound a month to get the parking space there um, and that was fine but at the other hospital Although there was a, a space for me, it wasn't an allocated space. You had to get there, which was really good. I worked at seven o'clock in the morning. You had to get there early. Otherwise, if you got there at eight o'clock, you wouldn't get a space because all the nurses had taken them. You know, the nurses quite rightly got spaces. Um, so yeah, working from home would, would resolve that as an issue because that's one issue I would have is where would I park? Because I don't think they offer the, the same park. The parking's all changed. Even the hospitals have changed now, you know. Anyway, I hope you found that interesting. Um, if you have any questions at all, then please leave them in the comments below. Um, studying is something I do miss because whilst I was doing my job in the NHS, I, I was always learning. And so I didn't, apart from the time I did study and I did, I did enjoy it, but I found it very hard going. Um, but my brain was kind of full of what I was already doing in my job. Whereas now I, I, miss, the, I miss the learning. I really do miss the learning. And if I had the brain power, I would do... I would be doing an open university course or some kind of course for sure. Um, but yeah, I hope you found that interesting. Thank you so much for listening and I'll speak to you again soon.